So let me just give you some background, and then you can throw it. I'll throw the floor open for you. Um, I never intended to write books. <laughs> I never intended to be an environmentalist, actually. I was uh, an engineer. I was trained as an engineer, and I was trained as a systems specialist. I came to this country after my bachelor's, and I did my master's in New York and my PhD at Stanford. I had some of the best systems people teaching me. I became a systems expert, and I was working on the internet from the 90s, mid-90s onwards. And at that time, the internet was some small thing that we academics were working on, and you know, and a few industry people, and I had my own small consulting company. And we were working on protocols for how to get the internet to be robust. And in the 90s, if you remember, the internet was not very popular. It had just come out, and you know, the World Wide Web was available. And there was an article in Newsweek saying, "Is the internet going to go anywhere?" Because you know, the, all the business models for the people buying books on the internet—how is that possible, right? So I remember that vividly because at that time I was working on the nuts and bolts of the internet, and I wasn't sure I had a future. <laughs> 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 Then it started taking off. You know, 96, our company got acquired by Level 1, uh, and I worked for Level 1 for three years, and Level 1 got acquired by Intel. It's the big, eating the small. And by 2003, we were selling 150 million units of this device a year. And by 2006, I overheard someone saying, I don't know how I can live without the internet. <laughs> so it was a, in 10 years, it went from nothing to and indispensable. So this is how fast change happens these days. In 2005, December, I happened to watch Al Gore's presentation on TV. The same presentation that he does for An Inconvenient Truth, but someone had videotaped it in San Francisco, and it was a fairly small, intimate group that he was talking to as well. And I was rooted, and I couldn't take my eyes off it. And I said, if half of what he's saying is true, what is everybody doing? Why is everybody working on other things? So I, I told my wife, you know, I'm just mesmerized by this. If this, if this is true, then we are wasting our time. And at that point, we were working on 10 gigabit Ethernet, doing the same thing 10 times faster. Now, she's such a supportive partner that I have in my life. She said, if you think this is true, go for it. Go work on it. So within three months, I told her, it's, not only is it true, this guy is an optimist. Uh -huh. Al Gore is an optimist. It's much worse than what he's saying. So... We decided to close our company at that point because we had, we had come out of Intel and we had started our own company up, uh, to do 10 gigabit at that time. And uh, then I wrote to Mr. Gore and I said, how can I help you? He was just about to start all his training programs at that point. So he sent me a letter saying, you know, would you like to be trained by me? And then you can go give the same talk to others. I said, sure, absolutely. So I was part of the second batch of people that he trained in 2006, December. As part of that thing, I had to give the same talk on 10 occasions. And after that, he said, this material is yours, you can do whatever you want. Around that time, I began to realize that the core problem is really our treatment of animals. The way we treat animals is so central to almost everything that's going on, because they're at the very bottom of this food chain. In 2007, I decided to start Climate Healers, register as a nonprofit, and start doing something formally. It's a very personal decision, and I was at the very depths of despair when I started to. I wanted to do something. I wanted to act, not just talk about it. So that's, this is the most frustrating part of Al Gore's thing, is just you go give the same presentation. And so I had this business model where you can actually buy solar torch lights, give it to people who are using kerosene for lighting, and claim carbon credits for all the kerosene they're not burning, and use that money to buy more torch lights. So it was a sustainable business, where you're replacing kerosene lamps with solar torch lights. And you know, on paper, it looks like a great business model. You, know, you just need to get $11 a metric ton for carbon credits, and you have a viable business model with this. Okay. So to start it off, I bought a thousand torch lights in Houston, had it shipped over to India, found an NGO that does work in remote regions where people don't have lights. And I went there. Uh, within half an hour, my business model fell apart. 
Why? Because the people who burn kerosene for lighting are not in the villages of India. They're in the cities. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> in the cities where they have electricity, but they burn kerosene for lighting. I said, what? how does that make any sense? And they said, well, you know, we have electricity, but the electricity is not on all the time. And as soon as it goes out, we cannot live without it, so we turn on our kerosene lamps. So that's where all the kerosene is being burned for lighting. These villagers also get three liters a month of kerosene from the ration shop, but they don't use it for lighting at all. They just use it to start their cooking fires. Do they use anything for lighting in the villages? No. None. So they told me, why do you want to change the night? God gave us night so we can go to sleep. <laughs> so I mean, my business model was completely you know, but then I realized, you know, I asked them, so how much kerosene do you use for cooking? And they said, well, three liters a month. And so, but how much wood do you use? They said, about 10 kgs a day. And I said, wow, <laughs> there's a business right there, right? So I said, if I give you solar cookers, uh, will you use them? And so then I can claim carbon credits for all the wood that you're not burning and, you know, use that to fund the solar cookers. They said, sure, show us how to make our rotis and we'll use them. They make corn rotis and wheat and millet rotis. And these are thick rotis they make. And corn rotis, they roll it by hand. So they're very thick and it takes a lot of energy to cook it. I realized that none of the solar cookers that were out there could cook their meal. If it had the energy to cook their meal, you couldn't stand near it. So it was all designed for putting a big pot and running away from it. And when the pot is done, come back and take it, right? For making rotis, it has to be interactive. You have to flip the rotis. Every 30 seconds, you have to flip it. I had to go hire a company in India to design a solar cooker that would cook their rotis. In the meanwhile, I asked them, if I, you know, if I give you these lights for free, will you take them? I said, sure, if it's for free, I mean, why not? So I gave every household two lights. In the villages or cities? In the villages, not in the cities, no. And this was in August of 2008. December of 2008, I went back to talk to this company that was going to do my solar cookers. So I went back. You know, I had been giving Algo's talks beyond 2007 into 2008. And I will always show like a before and after picture of a forest that village had saved. So it was a very special village. You know, they had saved about 250 acres of common land. And that land had become forest in like four years. So I was showing pictures of the forest from 2002 and what it looked like in 2006. And everyone would say, maybe they took the first picture during summer and the second picture during winter. I mean, they may be fooling you, right? How do you know it was taken at the same season? So I said, okay, I have to see this forest myself. I can't depend on someone else taking pictures and giving it to me. First of all, I went there and I was mobbed by the women, which was unusual. I mean, in August when I went, they wouldn't even look at me, right? They were sitting there off to the side and they had their paloos like this. <laughs> They would look, <laughs> when you ask a question, they would look with one eye and tell you an answer. But the men would always be forward, right? They were the men were the ones who were ask, answering all the questions. But this time in December, they were just running to me and hugging me. I mean, it's like almost touching me. And I asked the NGO, what happened? <laughs> Why are they like this? And the NGO said, that you are a big hero in the village now. Because from August to December, was snake bite season in the village. Because that's the time when the snakes are having babies and they're very aggressive. And, and that's, you know, you're getting into winter. So the women, every morning, they go into the forest to do their business before the men wake up. And after that, they don't go to the toilet at all. I mean, they really hold it. Right. Yep. This is a, a cultural practice? It's a cultural practice. I walk with them uh, to the forest to collect firewood and I can tell you, they don't drink water. Even in summer, they don't drink water. Okay, Just to make sure that they don't have to go to the bathroom. So they used to go to the bathroom early in the morning before the men wake up and they used to step on the snakes and the snakes used to bite them. So in that village had about 270 households. They used to get about 20 to 30 snake bites every year. And two to three women used to die from snake bites every year. And in 2008, they had zero snake bites. That the torch. Because of the torch light. <laughs> Completely unintended benefit. Okay? 
completely unintended benefit. And suddenly I had a village that would do anything I asked. So I knew that I had this perfect group that I could work with for the solar cookers. Right? It was such an amazing uh, turning point in my life because they, I asked them also to take me and show me the forest. And I saw on the left of the fence was bare, and on the right was lush green, and on the left there were all these old cows eating the grass, eating whatever was growing on the ground. So I, this is the picture I took. Wow. Okay, 2008. I took this picture and I swore on the spot, I'm going to go vegan. <laughs> whatever it takes, I'm going to go vegan. Why was the perfect line? There is a fence. The cattle cannot go to the right of that. Anything to the left, as soon as something new is growing, the cattle come and eat it. Or the goats come and eat it. If the cattle don't eat it, the goats will eat it. So, What are the villagers eating? <clears throat> they grow their own food. They raise cattle to milk them and to sell the milk to get money. That's their main source of cash. They don't eat the cows already. They don't eat the cows. And so because they don't eat the cows, the cows live for 25 years. All of them. This is a religious thing, right? It's a religious thing. The is in South India? In North India, in, in Rajasthan. Where is that? In uh, near Udaipur, in Udaipur district. Really? That's my pilgrimage hometown. So the, all the cows die of old age? Pretty much. Yeah. They won't eat the cows when they die. They bury them? No, they bury them. But would you eat a cow that's 15 years old? You know, that was the case with Bill and Lou three or four years ago. There were a couple of oxen that got slaughtered in Green Mountain College. And, oh, they, were, yeah. and they were going to eat them. This scientist I was talking to said, I mean, who would eat a cow that's 13 years old? I mean, the, the meat, meat is going to be so tough. People like to eat the babies. Yeah, you have to eat babies. So. Yeah, it is. I <laughs> no, there is a lot that we have to overcome, you know, and that's also part of my mission now. <coughs> So I um, took that picture and I said, I'm going to go vegan, absolutely. That trip, I had to go to Hyderabad. In fact, I, I was a mentor for Al Gore's training in Delhi. And uh, at that training, I met an actress, a Bollywood actress, who was at my table. And everybody was introducing themselves and I came to her and I said, who are you? And she said, you don't know me? I said, I know I don't. And she said, okay, I'm Amala Akineni, you know, this famous actress. So as she said, if you're coming to Hyderabad, you have to come visit me. And I had to go to Hyderabad for the lights. I was doing something else there. And she said, I just turned vegan a month ago. I said, what? I've been thinking about this. How did you do it? And what are you doing for your food? Because you know, I love my milk sweets. I love my, I love my yogurt. And I was thinking, how am I going to give this up, right? And uh, so she said, a month ago, I was asked to inspect a slaughterhouse and certify that it's meeting regulations, which is what they do in India. They ask the animal rights people to go and inspect slaughterhouses and certify that they're meeting regulations. So she had to inspect the slaughterhouse and that slaughterhouse was slaughtering 500 buffaloes every day. Cows are sacred, but buffaloes are fair game. She said these buffaloes were coming off the trucks and they had these shiny skins and they were all mothers who just stopped getting pregnant. And they had this quizzical look on their faces saying, what is happening? And they could see the knives coming at the other end. And the smell of the blood. She said, I mean, my God, it was so traumatic for me. And I said, I am causing this because I drink the milk. So she said, I have to quit. So she figured out how to make soy yogurt. I said, oh, thank you so much. I've been, I've been dreading that, yeah. So that's a good step. Then I went to Ahmedabad to meet with the, my team that's going to do the uh, solar cooker design. This gentleman told me, you know, if, oh, buffaloes, you should see this video on YouTube about buffaloes and how they chased away a lion to save their baby. And it's been viewed like 80 million times now. I mean, there are these buffaloes come together as a herd and they chase away a whole bunch of lions and rescue their calf. And I saw that video and I said, well, I think these buffalo mothers would like to do that to me too, when I see their milk. <laughs> and I became vegan. Within a week after I became vegan, I had this huge sense of guilt lift off my shoulders. And within a month, I lost all my arthritic pains. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, all along it was due to milk? You know, this doctor didn't tell me, he was giving me pills, you know, he was giving me like aspirin to take. 
I tell people my story and I say this is, not only is it good for the environment, it's good for your health and it's absolutely great for the animals. And you have to do it. So anyway, we got the solar cookers designed, ready to deploy in around 2009. And I happened to come to Chicago for a meeting. I ran into this professor from University of Iowa who said, I'd like to send 15 kids to, uh, from Iowa to your project and have them help you deploy these solar cookers. I said, of course, please. Because I was dreading how am I going to assemble all this and this would be great, right? Having kids from the Midwest who are engineers and you know, uh, smart kids who would come and do the assembly for me in the villages and deploy them. So I said, yes, that'd be great. And then the organizer of the meeting took me to Bath's temple, Swaminarayan temple. He said, if the Swamiji's in Swaminarayan temple want to help you with deploying solar cookers, my God, you can deploy it all over India because they have so much money. They even have a gold dome on their temple. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. They're actually building one in New Jersey now. It's like probably the biggest one. The stone came over from India? The stone in New Jersey, that stone came from Italy from one single mountain, because the Baps people went and bought the mountain mm. in Italy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and they, and they are, they're taking the marble from that mountain, shipping the marble to India, having it carved by people, and shipping it all the way back to New Jersey. They do have a lot of money, right? So I went to the Baps temple to, so that I could convince the Swamiji to fund my solar cookers. And of course the Swamiji was busy, so they made us sit outside, wait for him. And then after about half an hour, the person comes out and says, you know, he's too busy, he's not going to be able to meet you. So why don't you just sit in front of this, in the Sabha, and then after he's finished talking, you can go and meet him. He'll be the first in line. And we were walking towards the assembly hall, and this old man comes and approaches me. He says, so I heard, you know, you're doing solar cookers. And said, yeah, I'm doing all that. And then he takes me past the assembly hall, and he hugs me and he puts his thumb on my forehead and he says, do your work without any ego and let me do it through you. What? He said, this is, this is Sri Krishna talking to you through me. And then he walks away. Okay? He walks away, but his thumb was on my forehead still. I walk into the assembly hall, his thumb is still on my forehead and I was in a daze. So after two hours, I went up to see the Swamiji and I was still in a daze. And the Swamiji just said, oh, you know, I'm from IIT, are you from IIT? And so we exchanged pleasantries and that was it. We walked out. But his thumb was still on my forehead. So I said, okay, I better do what I was told. Do your work without any ego. Let me do it through you, right? So that's simple. So we went and deployed the solar cookers. I deployed six of them that December, just to see whether the women like them, what do they like, what do they not like. So I didn't want to deploy hundreds of them right away, so we just deployed six of them. And I went back in May of 2010, and not a single one was being used. I mean, this is the village where the women would do almost anything for me, but they weren't using solo cookers. So I said, okay, tell me what happened. Why are you not using this? And they said, why did you do the solo cookers different from the lights? We love the lights, but this, what is this? I said, tell me why, why is it different? And they said, the lights, we just leave them on top of our huts, we go do our work, we come back in the evening and they're fully charged, and we use them. We use them at night, we use them the next morning. The solar cooker, you leave them and nothing happens. <laughs> you want us to cook at two o'clock in the afternoon, we are not there, we are out in the field working. And you're asking us to cook outside, we like to cook inside. You're asking us to cook standing up, we like to cook sitting down. It's like the exact opposite of what they're doing now, I was asking them to do. So they said, this won't work for us. So I immediately wrote to this professor from Iowa and I said, I'm sorry, but it looks like, you know, we're not going to be deploying solar cookers. We have a, it's a much bigger problem than I thought. Perhaps it's not worth it for you to send students. So I didn't expect uh, Iowa students to come. He sends me an email saying, 11 kids are coming to the project, and I didn't have solar cookers to deploy, <laughs> right? So I had to figure out something to do with them. Yeah. And along with the kids comes this professor of mechanical engineering. I told him they didn't like it, so they wanted one just like the lights, which means you have to collect the energy during the day and help them cook at night inside their huts. 
and the next morning inside their huts. So it's a storage solar cooker is what you need. He said, oh, I have to do a senior class project for the mechanical engineering seniors. And I can put my entire class working on this next semester. Are you going to engineering and fix the problem? No. Well, he got his students to work on it. In fact, all the students worked on it. And I was invited by the president of the University of Iowa to have lunch with him for having introduced this amazing project to University of Iowa and how you know, University of Iowa is going to change the world. They built it and their simulation showed it's going to work. And in reality, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. At all. It's like barely increased the temperature by like five degrees. You know? Suddenly, I became like persona non grata in the president's office. I told the students, look, don't get disappointed because this is the way usually things work. You have a model and didn't match reality. So you have to figure out why the model didn't match reality and fix the model and figure out how it's going to work. So it's going to take time. So his team has been working on this for the past four years. And now they have something that could work. So we are going to go try it out this December. And even though it's going to work, it's going to cost a lot of money because we've got all kinds of salts where you have to store the energy. You know? All so, because people don't want to cook during the day. Right. Yeah. It doesn't go work in those meetings. And it's going to cost like a thousand dollars each, you know. And I'm saying I can't afford that, you know. I mean, how can you give poor people thousand dollar equipment, right? Last year, in January, we decided to try out efficient stoves, and I went with a bunch of interdisciplinary people: historians, anthropologists, sociologists, architects, and mechanical engineers. This whole team went, of professors from University of Iowa. They all got a grant, and we went there, and we deployed these efficient stoves these rocket stoves. Rocket stoves are big, right? I mean, yeah. everybody talks about them. They're supposed to reduce wood use by 50%, 60%, whatever. We bought them and we gave it to the women, the best stoves in the market. We got nine of them, gave it to the women. We said, use them and tell us what you like and what you don't like about them. And you sit there and you watch them cook. And you realize that these stoves are not going to work. And these women were saying, why do you want to torture me like this? <laughs> Make me cook with this. <laughs> They prefer their chulas. I mean, their chula, it's a brick with mud around it, and they put their pans on top and they cook, right? They put their firewood inside and cook. And they were saying, the problem with the rocket stoves is, first of all, it's made of metal. You touch the metal on the side, my child is going to get hurt because it's getting really hot on the outside. Secondly, you can only put small twigs inside, and when we get big logs, what are we going to do? We have to burn it. You want me to cut it lengthwise? Forget it. I'm not going to do that, right? And the flame is too narrow because the stoves are designed to be narrow because they want to reduce the heat loss from the sides. So the flame is too narrow, it's burning my roti in the middle, it's not cooking it on the side. And because they use a clay tawa, they said, why don't we give you a metal tawa? They said, if I cook with metal, my husband will kill me because he likes the taste of clay. Yeah. And minerals, probably. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about the minerals, you're right. <laughs> there are like seven different things they said that was wrong with the stoves. And we said, how much would you pay for them? I said, you have to pay for them? <laughs> so I said, you know, let's look at their stove. I mean, they have none of these problems. They can put any size wood. It's insulated on the outside. Everything is perfect in their stove. The only problem is that it is inefficient. So let's look at why is it inefficient. It's inefficient because embers are falling off the edge of the logs. And over time, they're piling up and they're all smoking. They're smoldering away. And that's where the smoke is coming from, that's where the inefficiency is coming from. If you look at any fireplace, they have grates. That's how you get airflow, right? So the embers fall on the grates instead of on the ground, then the air would burn them. So let's try giving them a grate, a simple grate that can elevate their wood a little bit and it provides airflow from below. So we made a grate and gave it to one of the women and said, try it out. And the wood use decreased by 60%. Wow. Okay. So I was shocked. I said, it can't be that simple. <laughs> How is it that nobody figured this out? You know? <laughs> and so I had it tested at the cook stove testing center in Udaipur. And the official result was 63% reduction in wood and 89% reduction in soot. Wow. As soon as I got that report, I said, that's it. I'm getting a thousand of them made. I'm going to deploy it in four villages over there. And I want to see what their reaction is. Give it to every household. We did that in July of last year. Because I have all these sociologists and anthropologists, they're telling me what to do now. It's a go to a representative sampling. They did a survey before, survey after, and all that. In January, I went to about 80 households out of the 1,000 we gave to. And 
71% of them are using it on a regular basis. They would kill you if you try to take it away from them. <laughs> well, they're saving a lot of wood. They're saving a lot of wood and there's much less smoke. The wood is burning much more efficiently, right? So there's much less wood being used and the wood itself is burning much more efficiently. So you get a squaring effect. That's why it's an 89% reduction in soot. Yeah, actually what happens is the, the smoke actually is combusted. Right. So there isn't smoke. Why are the other 30 not using it? Ah. The other 29%, they're not using it because either they didn't attend the class where they taught them what oh. to do with it. So they said, what is this metal thing? And no. they put it up on the shelf. No. <laughs> the others, they knew what to do with it, but their stove was a little bit too small. Oh. It didn't fit this. They said, I'm not going to break my stove for your great, you know. They said, next time we rebuild the stove, we'll make sure it fits. Because they're rebuilding it every two years. It's just brick and mud. According to the sociologists, this is a grand success. <laughs> They've uh, never had 71% uptake. Well, we should have them in our parks, because the parks where I'm going to do tomorrow, every campsite has a fireplace, and everybody has a fire on it. And if we had these grates, we'd be cooking. You'd be cooking, <laughs> you'd be cooking much better. Grace, but no For cooking your food on it, but that's not where you put the wood. Oh, the wood I see. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. what you need is to get the wood off. Right, yeah. a little bit off the ground with yeah. holes underneath, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Simple stuff. I'm going to see if I can bring something up, just, just on the fly. Right. This is very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are deploying another thousand in Ghana, we are going to deploy another thousand in India. But this time I'm trying to figure out a way to raise the money so it spreads really fast. So I've told the NGOs, I'm going to only give you like 10 per village. Go and give to 10 different people within the village. So the other city like it, then you can come to the whole village and say, okay, how many do you want? But you have to pay me $5 each. So use it to generate revenues so that you can then buy more and leverage the NGOs that are already there who are doing good work. So it makes the women love the NGOs now, you know, because they brought the greats to them. So now I became a hero a second time <laughs> in the same village. <laughs> That's a huge lesson, you see, because you started off with solar cookers and you wound up with a little grate. <laughs> and that was because I had a multidisciplinary team that told me, hey, don't do that, don't do this. Like the sociologist told me, don't ever try to change their chula. You can add something to their chula that can be removed and thrown away if they don't like it. So that's when we came up with a great idea. Otherwise, we were thinking of putting a hole and collecting ash underneath this to digging underneath their floor and he said, if you try any of that, I'm going to kill you. So, right. you know what is happening though in India too. Indian government has a program where they're willing to give, I think it's 500 rupees per household as an incentive if the household adopts an efficient stove. So, the efficient stove costs like 3,000 rupees. So, 500 rupees is like $7, okay? So, the efficient stove costs like $40 or something. So, if you buy a $40 stove, the government will give you $7. And I went to the government and I said, they don't like that stove. For $7, I can give them two grades. I mean, it's like you can get a grade for free. If I give them a grade for free and give them an incentive to use the grade, right? So why don't you give me that subsidy and I can flood the place with grades? And they said, no, because the stove manufacturers, yeah. I can, uh, it has to be manufactured equipment. It's not some simple stuff that you can... What well, can they manufacture grades? Not enough money in it. Not enough material, not enough use. So, so you have to go through the NGOs then. You have to go through the NGOs and do it on the side, you know, because the government is hell bent on giving them these stores that they're not going to use. But everything that has happened in this project since then has been just organic. Because I just let go. I said, whatever happens, happens. Let go. And in 2010, our granddaughter was born to our second son. Our second son tried to commit suicide in 2007 which is when I started my climate healers. Because I realized at the point that in order to heal my family, I had to heal the whole world. I had to work on healing the whole world. It's not just a single family issue. You know? It's just happening everywhere. Everyone is going through things like this. And this son gave me a granddaughter. So to me, it was her birth was a redemption. It's like, there is hope for humanity. We are going to come out of this. Okay? So I held her in my arms and I said, my God, we have to figure out a positive story so that she has a future, that this redemption is going to happen. But even though I may not know it now, I'm going to write down everything I know so far so that even if I die tomorrow, I have left what I know. So that's when I started writing this book. And the Carbon Dharma, the, um, it says the occupation of butterflies. 
because the basic positive story that I came up with was the analogy of the caterpillar to the butterfly. The caterpillar is just blindly consumes, but only for about two to three weeks. And then the caterpillar stops when it has consumed so much that it's too big for its own skin. The caterpillar stops, weaves a cocoon, hangs under a twig, and meditates for a week. It wakes up as a butterfly. And as a butterfly, she's a very discriminating consumer. She only sips nectar from flowers. And as she sips nectar from flowers, she pollinates the flowers. She regenerates life. She undoes the damage she did as a caterpillar. And I said, that is such a perfect metaphor for the transformation that human beings have to undergo today. And we are undergoing that. Okay? So that's the positive story I started writing. It's obvious when you start looking at it that this is happening. The transformation is happening. And it is veganism. It is that change in food. Like no one else had been doing veganism before, right? This change in food. That is the symbol for the butterfly happening. Because veganism is something that can unite all of us, regardless of our cultures. Because everyone has to change. Because everyone was using some animal or the other, in some form or the other, throughout our lives. There are very few people who have been vegan for a long time. But at that point, I really didn't have an idea of how it would fit.